James Griffith's latest book is entitled Fable, Method, and Imagination in Descartes. It was published 2018 by Palgrave Macmillan, and his lecture will be drawing from this research, if I am rightly anticipating. He is an assistant professor of political thought and philosophy at the Bratislava International School of Liberal Arts in Slovakia. He received his PhD from the Department of Philosophy at DePaul University in Chicago, and his MA from the Department of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research in New York. He primarily works on early modern philosophy, continental philosophy, and political philosophy. The lecture will be around 40 minutes, then we have some time scheduled for discussion, and then we go to the break, and then we continue. Welcome. I'm going to begin. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'm going to begin with a series of apologies, as so many academic talks do. Um, first, for my German pronunciation. Uh, there's not much German in here, but I'll just apologize for it. Uh, also, the the text itself took on slightly different direction than than the abstract, which also tends to happen. But it's still roughly in the same structure. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, I think I'll just begin. So, I would like to begin to inaugurate or originate my talk with a word of appreciation to the Department of Architecture Theory and Philosophy of Technics at Technical University of Vienna, especially to Vera Bullemann and, uh, and Ludger Hoverstadt at, uh, at ATH Zurich. I would like to thank them for the kind of an invitation to this most interesting conference it was an unexpected invitation, and is all the more fully cherished as a result. Appreciation, as I'm sure many know, comes from the Latin appretiatus, itself meaning a pricing, a pretium, a pricing toward, at, or up, ad. Pretio enters Latin through the ancient Greek priamai, which is buying, and originally from Sanskrit's pana or parna, a wager or a loan. I hope then, or rather my wager is, that the appreciation I feel for, the esteem or value I place upon being invited and accepted, or will be accepted, or may be bought, that the appreciation will be appreciated. Thank you again, and thank you, especially Vera Bullman. What I'm hoping to elaborate, or perhaps point to, is not necessarily new or original, since some of it can be found in my book and a recent article. That is said to point out that this will be a reworking or reformation of things I've been working on for a little while, to indicate that, if it is original, its originality is in something of, a, of the past. As with so many original things, originality coming from Latin's origo, meaning both beginning and lineage. And this second aspect of origo differentiates it from ancient Greek's arche and archon. The nine archontes of archaic Greek, or sorry, archaic Athens may have been leaders, but their descendants are not included in the word. Each descendant of an origo however, seems to itself be an origo, which I hope will apply to this talk as well, leaving it as original as its origins, if they are themselves original. But I also wanted to begin this particular, if not precisely unique talk, with the words appreciation and originality, with a few words about their lineages, because of their importance to the topic at hand. Few, few thinkers in the Western canon are obsessed with originality, with establishing themselves as original as René Descartes. And what he seeks to establish or found in his origination is, of course, an arcade for all, for everyone's ability or faculty to know that their ideas are clearly and distinctly perceived and therefore known. This obsession is no more clear than when, at the end of the first part of, this, of the discourse on method, he says that he learned during his years of encountering other customs not to believe much of what he had assumed from his own customs and habits, that he had thus decided to seek out the truth within himself. The fruits of this search have, he says earlier in part one, given him a method to discern truth from falsehood, which he wants to show to his readers, both in the hope that they will imitate it, it or him. Imite, coming from Latin, imito, to copy, resemble, or counterfeit. 
Descartes wants to present himself as an originator of a method he presents to others that they might make, uh, that they might make their own, which they can perhaps value or appreciate on their terms, beyond or other than a larger economy of values in copying or forging it. He hopes that they will be original, originate their own counterfeit, counterfeit versions of the method, if only for themselves. Most importantly for my purposes here, he explicitly says that he does not want to teach, enseigne, drawn from, the, drawn from insigno in Latin, to mark within or to impress. Descartes is consistently suspicious of teachers. Nevertheless, he also, still in part one of the discourse, marks out an appreciation for his, for his education. Despite all the doubts he had felt upon finishing it, despite, <clears throat> excuse me, despite all the discontent he feels from what he had learned, he did not, quote, cease to value, estime, to value the exercise done, done in the schools. Fables awaken the mind, history uplifts it, poetry delights, mathematics satisfies curiosity and eases labor, moral writings are, are useful for virtue, theology, quote, instructs, on Sanya, instructs us how to reach heaven, philosophy lets us speak about anything, and law and medicine bring us honor. Even the false lessons here, lessons here are worth learning, if only not to be deceived by them. So what is the problem with his education? Why did he abandon it, even beyond recognizing the falsehoods into which it had led him? More to the point, why is Descartes so careful here to distinguish himself from teachers? Well, for one thing, he says, this is in the discourse as well, quote, one who presumes to give precepts, precept, must think himself, se doit estime, more skillful than those to whom, he, uh, to whom he gives them, il les donne, which he claims not to think of himself. What is more, however, to be a précepteur, a tutor, would undermine the possibility of the method being imitated to, to, by others to found for themselves the knowledge that their ideas may, clearly and be, may be clearly and distinctly perceived. After all, no, no one would need to judge it, juger, to judge it themselves, Precepts are given. Descartes' method is judged as imitable or not. Yet there must be a reason for this self-esteem or self-estimation, this self-appreciation of teachers. There must be a reason why they think they can give, hand over their precepts. That is, this self-estimation could not come from nowhere. It must have come from a preformed conception of the role or position of the teacher such that they can estimate themselves as worthy to give precepts to others and such that they can estimate others as worth being given them. I will claim that, for Descartes, the reason is their conception of or metaphor for the mind, which I will discuss a bit more now by looking at the notebook titled Cogitationes Private and the dialogue titled The Search for Truth by Means of the Natural Light. So uh, the first section is titled Sparks and Vessels. The Cogitatione, Cogitationes was kept between 1619 and 1622, during Descartes' travels around Europe. It was thus primarily kept in the aftermath of the vision he had on November 10th, 1619, and I just realized when I was rereading this how, that we just hit the 400th anniversary of the dreams. So anyway, uh, on November 10th, 1619, in the famous stove-heated room, the Coel, described in the discourse. While he was traveling from, tra from witnessing the, co the coronation of the Holy Roman Emperor, Ferdinand II, to rejoin the army of Maximilian I, Duke of Bavaria, during the Thirty Years' War. The incomplete dialogue, which is titled The Search for Truth, this has, uh, however, an unclear date of composition. The original manuscript has been lost, and the initial Latin translation only appeared in 1701, which is 51 years after Descartes' death, so it may be one of his earlier writings, or it may date from his latest 1641. So it's possible that both of these texts are, are early Cartesian writings, or they may represent the beginning and middle of his career. Using them to make claims about Descartes' conception of, of the mind is then somewhat controversial. There is a debate within Descartes' scholarship as to how, how his conception changed, how much his conception changed over the course of his career. To take one fairly recent example, Peter Mockamer and J.E. Maguire argue that Descartes slowly, though never fully, abandons the intuitionism of his early period, which includes the discourse, in favor of, eventually, an understanding of the limits of human understanding. For them, the Meditations on First Philosophy, published in, in 1641, and so the latest point at which the search may have been composed, begins this shift, 
which culminates in 1644's Principles of Philosophy. This, date, this debate, however, does not seem especially relevant to my concerns because I'm, here I'm asking after Descartes' conception of the mind as it relates to his understanding of education, an understanding that's consistent throughout his career. With that said, one of the undated notes in the Cogitationes explains that, quote, the sparks of knowledge, and there the Latin is uh, semina scientia, the, the sparks of knowledge are in us as in a flint, unquote. Semina can be, a, can, be a poetic reference to <coughs> uh, sorry, can be a poetic reference to the elements of other bodies, especially, for my purposes, fire and water. I assume that that and the reference to flint are why John Cottingham correctly chose to translate the word as he did. Here, knowledge is held within a mind that is, a, that is dense and hard as stone, as earth. In poetry, the imagination's force strikes it to produce knowledge. By contrast, philosophers quote, extract these sparks from the flinty mind. But more precisely, they lead or draw them out, a dupuntur, that's the, line, that's the Latin in the, cogita, in the cogitationes. So education then, or at least philosophical education, is a leading out of the light within stone, a drawing forth of knowledge. The search, the search for truth, is a dialogue preceded by a brief introduction. The dialogue is between epistemon, the knowledgeable man, polyander, every man, and Eudoxus, the man of good judgment or right opinion. The latter has invited the others to stay with him to, quote, to show, declarer ouvertement, to show you a part of what I know. His intent is not to prescribe, prescribere, the method which Polyander should follow in his search for the truth, but simply to, de to describe, to proponere, to lay before or expose to view to describe or propose the method which I have used, I left it up to each individual to use it or reject it entirely as he saw fit." In the, inter in the introduction, then, the problem with scholastic or, sco or scholarly education is that the ignorance with which we enter the world leads to an imagination filled, and the word is rempié, uh, filled by preceptio with, with false thoughts, leaving us in need of, another, of either a great nature or instructions, i.e. a plan to rebuild from within, instructions from a sage. Should we be so lucky, we can remake, deform, and here the French is defer, deform minds which have been preoccupied, preoccupé, with bad doctrines, minds with doctrines that have taken up residence prior to its formation. At the same time, and this is going back to the text itself, we can find within ourselves, without any help from anyone else, unquote, this knowledge, if we can take up on our own, the approach Eudoxus proposes. Whether through our own talents, through the sage's instructions, or by following our own version of Eudoxus' proposed method, the search intends to defer, to unmake or deform what has been malformed by the bad doctrines and thoughts that have filled and occupied our minds thanks to scholastic and scholarly teaching. Between the cogitationes and the search, regardless of the latter's chronological origin, we have a sense of a, of a mind that is dense and hard as rock but which can produce sparks, if struck correctly, or if led out by philosophical education, at least. That education must be properly philosophical, however, uh, which scholastic or scholarly education's teaching fails to do. The problem with that teaching is that it fills, rompier, the, fills the mind with bad thoughts. Now, rompier, rompier is not just to fill up a container, but also to fulfill a capacity. The capacity that has been badly fulfilled is the sparks waiting to be let out by the philosophical education or by imaginative force. If we take up as our own the method Descartes, that Descartes proposes, that he shows for imitation, for copy, or counterfeit, we can not just rediscover our mind's capacities for sparks, but also deform and reform a mind that has been malformed by scholasticism and scholarly doctrines and teaching. The way that scholastic and scholarly education fills the mind malforms it. And my contention is that the very thought, the very teaching that assumes that such minds are, that minds are such thing as, things as to be filled, that they are empty vessels to be occupied by doctrines, is what malforms them, such that they need to be deformed and reformed. This is why Descartes not only offers up a new method, but offers it as something to be imitated on one's own terms, in one's own way. The mind for Descartes is a solid with light within it. If we approach it that way, rather than as an empty vessel waiting to be filled by, with doctrines and teachings, we can draw the light out of it 
why this, uh, why this difference is important can hopefully be explained by looking to Descartes' understanding of physical space in the world or treatise on light and the principles of philosophy. So uh, now the second section is the physical plane. So the world was written between 1629 and 1633 and thus is part of Descartes' early period. Published posthumously, it was to introduce his physics, but he abandoned it after Galileo's condemnation. And as we have it, it's incomplete. It literally breaks off in the middle of a sentence. In it, Descartes describes the three elementary bodies, fire, air, and earth. The difference between them is the ease of separating their parts, depending on their liquidity or hardness. Fire is the most liquid element with the smallest and most flexible parts, allowing it to penetrate most deeply into other bodies. Air is between the, other, is between the others in its fluidity, and Descartes even believes that it must always have some fire in it in order to explain how it changes shape in, in its motions. Earth is the largest and slowest of the elements, composing most larger bodies and with little to no motion of its own. As the motions of fire br bring it into collision with the other elements, Pieces of it break off from the initial body and it slows down, causing it to become air or earth. Earth, however, is hard enough to resist the collisions that impact it, although pieces of it can be lost in those collisions, thus allowing those pieces to be sped up by other collisions. And the bodies we perceive are mixtures of these three elements, and these mixed bodies give and take each other's motions, which accordingly decreases and increases their own. But what is the condition of these motions and collisions? elementary or mixed. All bodies are touched, <coughs> excuse me, all bodies are touched on all sides by other bodies. What is more, as soon as one body leaves its place, its lieu, another replaces it in a circularity of motion. That is, there is no vacuum. What we perceive as a vacuum, all those spaces, all those espaces that people think to be empty, vide, is filled, remplir, filled with matter. In the principles, that important late work, Descartes clarifies this distinction between place and space, though he does change the vocabulary in his, in his discussion of locus internus and locus externus. The former is not distinct from the corporeal substance contained in it. The spatial components of, the bo of a body, its extension or length, its breadth and its depth, constitute its space, its spatium. Locus externus, however, is a body's shape and size, shape, and position relative to other bodies. And these relations to other bodies gives us the various bodies' mutual surfaces, their superficies, understood as the boundary between surrounding and surrounded bodies. What we think of as the space occupied by a body is only our attributing to the extension a generic meaning. As well, the th in the principles then, the world is still a plenum. And as well, the three elementary bodies and the difference between hard and liquid bodies is the same between the two texts. So to return to the world, Descartes there presents a fable of the beginning, asking the reader to consider the prime matter of the world as a, quote, a real, perfectly solid, solide, perfectly solid body. This solid matter is divisible however we may imagine, which division he further asks us to imagine God having done, generating the mutual surfaces of loca externa. The partitioning of this primal solid is what begins motion within it, leaving the laws of motion to bring those parts into the, from seeming chaos to, quote, a most perfect world in which one will be able to see not only light, but also all the other things, both general and particular, that appear in this true world. So in the beginning, there was a solid, a, perfect, a prime matter that matches the description of the element of Earth, though without distinct elements with which to engage in collision. Partitioning this primal solid generates those other elements. There is no vacuum between, between them, no empty space. Space is produced from out of their separation from the primal solid, from their being generated as elemental loca externa, from their differentiation both from each other and from that prime matter. But it's not distinct from these, elemen from these elemental bodies as such. A trace of the primal solid remains insofar as this world is a plenum. The difference between it and this world is motion and collision between the elements. In colliding with each other, these elements slow each other down and speed each other up such that light becomes air, air becomes earth, earth becomes air, and air becomes light. In mixing with each other, 
these elements form the things we perceive at the, of the wor- in the world as we perceive it. Still, motion, and thus the world as distinct from the primal side, seems to depend on the elemental fire or light. That fire, the smallest and most liquid element, is also the fastest. <clears throat> its presence in the world is what keeps motion, what keeps bodies changing locations in circular plenic motion, what maintains the world as a world, what keeps the elements from slowing down back into the primal solid. To be sure, both motion and rest are, in the world as well as in the principles, qualities of bodies, equally qualities of bodies. The world differentiates motion and rest respectively as qualities of matter, while it either changes or remains in place, and in the principles, (coughs) motion and rest require the same amount of action. An object at rest resists being moved from its location when hit by other bodies. But the primal solid has nothing to resist. There we go, sorry. (laughs) But the primal solid has nothing to resist, let alone anything with which it could collide. The element of Earth does not move or moves very little, but but primarily resists being moved to varying degrees. Fire, light, moves, keeps the world in circular planet motion, thus keeping it orderly. It may be the partitioning of the primal solid that itself began the motions leading to the elements and then the world we perceive coming to be, but that motion slows down without light in constant collision with the other elements in the partition. Now, all of this is important not only in order to emphasize the physics of Descartes' plenum world, but also because it shows us the difference between the primal solid, which remains a solid like the element of Earth, and the world as we perceive it. The plenum continues after the partition, but the pre-partition is dense and solid, like flint. Also like flint, because fire or light is what inaugurates and maintains the orderly motion of the world, the primal solid has sparks within it. Why this simile is important will hopefully become clearer after the next section, so the the mental plenum. So Descartes begins his world's fable by asking the reader to, quote, allow your thoughts to wander beyond this world, to view another, wholly new one, which I shall cause to unfold before it in the imaginary, in imaginary space, espace imaginaire. As Daniel Garber explains it, the thought of imaginary space originates from a conflict between the church and the institutional, scholastic, and Aristotelian physics. Aristotle had claimed that in the physics that voids would mean moving things would not stop, would move in all directions simultaneously, and would, move, and would all move at the same speed. According to Garber, this claim is difficult for Christianity to accept because it, w- it implies even God could not create an empty space. So in 1277, Bishop Etienne Saint-Pierre of Paris condemned the doctrine and scholars were forced to rethink the void. What they settled on was imaginary space, an empty space beyond the world whence God could move the world as a whole. And by Descartes' time, this empty imaginary space was often taken as as a space independent of the bodies that occupy it. As Jean-Pierre Cavalier rightly points out, Descartes is playing on this meaning by giving us an imaginary space distinct from the real world, but one that's precisely not empty because it's conceivable by the imagination. So Descartes asks the readers to conceive an imaginary, uh, in imaginary space, the plenum of the primal solid. The fable of this world of plenic imaginary space, this imagined world of a primal solid, causes me to reflect on the locus of the imagination, and thus on the mind's faculties, its partitions. In the principles, we have an infinitely free will and a finite intellect, sensation and imagination. We judge correctly when our will to know leads us to judge within the scope of our intellect what our intellect can perceive. We err, however, when we allow the infinite will to exceed our intellect's limits through childhood's preconceived opinions, imagining that its sensations exactly matched what it perceived, through the inability to erase these erroneous childhood judgments or to imagine the correct ones, through a tiredness undermining our habits of, of limiting our judgments of what the intellect perceives, or through perceiving the words we, uh, believing the words we use are necessarily connected to the concepts they express. The struct- this structure matches, matches that presented in the meditations fairly well. But in Descartes' last book, The Passions of the Soul, this structure changes somewhat. And there we have two kinds of will, one terminating in the soul and another in the body, two kinds of perception, one one caused by the soul and the other caused by the body, a will that's an action with respect to the soul and a passion with respect to perception, 
an imagination and similar thoughts that can imagine both non-existent things caused by the body and purely intelligible things. And two kinds of perception, one re referring to the body as appetites and another referring to the soul as passions. The major difference to, uh, to which I want to draw attention is that of the imagination. While in the meditations and principles, it seems to be exclusively passive and tied to sensations, in the passions, the imagination can imagine purely intelligible things. This imagination is the one Descartes deploys in the beginning of his fable of the world by asking us to conceive in imaginary space the primal solid and the elemental plenum forming within it, following from its partition. However, it would also seem to be the imagination deployed in two key early moments in the meditations, the wax and the evil genius. So Descartes leads himself to the wax by acknowledging that, despite what he now knows, he has sensory perceptions, images, which are more distinct than what he calls the unimaginable self. To prove to himself that he knows through the intellect, he will let his imagination off the leash. Doing so allows him to examine the wax and recognize that, despite all the changes in its appearance, he judges the wax to remain the same substance. Thus, he concludes, quote, it is not the faculty of the imagination, imaginandi faculta, that gives me my grasp of the wax as flexible and changeable, and that, quote, the nature of this piece of wax is in no way revealed by my, my, by my imagination, but is perceived by my mind alone. The imagination was therefore unleashed to bring it back within its limits, but also to allow the unimaginable, the thinking thing, which is purely intelligible, to be more clearly and distinctly perceived by the intellect. But perhaps more importantly is the evil genius. There, Descartes is beset by his preconceived opinions and habits of thought, and cannot maintain the radicality of the doubt he has been cultivating throughout the first meditation. Thus, he introduces the idea of an evil genius, a figure with all the qualities of God, save non-deception, that's intent on, dece on deceiving him. However, Descartes introduces this figure by saying, I think it will be a good plan to turn my will in completely the opposite direction and deceive myself. By supposing that the evil genius, in order to continue, uh, by supposing the evil genius, in order to continue to resist his preconceived opinions and old habits. On the one hand, his, his self-deception is not serious in that it's not deception, but a willful imagining against deceptive sense perception. On the other, it's most serious in that he imagines the most unimaginable thing, a being as perfect as God, save for non-deception. Such a being, like God, like the mind, has no body, and so no image of it can be formed. More importantly, it is this unimaginable image which leads him to the later unimaginable image of the mind, of the self as a thinking thing. Yet, once perceived by the intellect through this non-deceptive self-deception, through the cogito, Descartes immediately says, I do not yet have a, have a sufficient understanding of what this I is. Later, having clarified his understanding of being a thinking thing, he says, quote, I will use my imagination, imaginabo, to discover that he is, quote, a thing that doubts, understands, affirms, denies, is willing, is unwilling, and also imagines and has sense perceptions. In other words, he uses the imagination to discern the faculties of the thinking thing. In question is whether those faculties were present as faculties, as partitions of the mind prior to the imagining. Thinking back to the, to the passions, the imagination is here in the meditation in the meditations used to imagine something purely intelligible, but it's also being used to reveal the faculties of which the imagination is one. The imagination then draws itself out, discerns itself. Yet there still needs to be taken into account, distinct even from the self-deception that leads to the evil genius, which itself leads to the faculties, the fiction that frames the entire meditations, which is the fiction of Descartes sitting in his room and writing these meditations over the course of six days. The entirety of the meditations, then, is itself an imagining. This time, like the imagination's use with the wax, it is an imagining of images, even if non-existent. This use of the imagination is of the first kind from the passions, yet it is what will allow him to show to himself, as well as to his readers, the second kind of use of the imagination in imagining the evil genius and the mind's faculties. The imagination, whether of the first or second kind, 
here seems to serve the same function as the in, for the mind as fire does in the world's fable. It is the capacity within the substance at hand which begins and maintains the partition of that substance and the motions of its parts. The mind, like the world, is a plenum. The differences between its faculties a series of mutual surfaces of non-extended substance becoming themselves thanks to the motions maintained through the imagination's light. Here is the imaginary space of the world's fable, as plenic in itself as the world it imagines. In this way, Descartes' understanding of the mind never changes from his earliest days, in the cogitationes when he compared it with a flint. The difference between the cogitationes and the meditations is that here the imagination draws sparks. It's the imagination that draws sparks, themselves the, the light of the imagination, out of the mind solid, settling into motion the uh, setting into motion the different mental elements called the faculties. In other words, our imaginations educate our flinty minds. So, last point. Faculties, faculties and origins. <clears throat> I hope then that you'll appreciate a final word about education. In the prefatory letter to the French translator of the principles, Abbé Claude Picot, Descartes once more turns to the question of education which is appropriate enough since he intended that book, The Principles, as a textbook to, re to replace Aristotelianism. In this letter, he writes that there are four ways to obtain wisdom. Clear ideas obtained by meditation, sensory perception, conversations with others, and reading books by those who can give good instructions. Instruction. Now, throughout history, he says, some have, thought, have sought out a fifth way, by, counting first by finding first causes and principles. And Plato and Aristotle are his, are his exemplars here. And while Plato admitted he never, found, he never found any first principles, Aristotle stated his purpose, his supposed discoveries, as certain. And having acquired wisdom from the four ways mentioned above, those who came after Aristotle accepted his claims, sometimes to the point that they corrupted his meaning. But even those who were not Aristotelians have been formed by their influence. For instance, what in, what in Aristotle is the division of the soul into nutritive, perceptual, and intelligent is in Aquinas a possible faculty of, of intellect which requires an agent to, to act upon it. Through this transformation of Aristotle, scholastic and scholarly pedagogy becomes an architectonics of the mind's architecture, an architecture of faculties which were established to, uh, prior to engaging them through teaching. It's in this way that, for Descartes, as early as the rules for the direction of the mind, probably written in 1628, its scholastic teachers of logic, quote, prescribe, prescribum, certain forms of reasoning in which the conclusions follow with such ir irresistible necessity that if our reason relies upon them, it can draw a conclusion which is certain simply in virtue of the form, ex vi formae. That is to say, these teachers rely on the form more than the content which allows them to arrive at conclusions prior to questions being asked. This formal priority apply, applies as well to their, to their approach to teaching, insofar as the faculties are taken in this Thomistic sense of requiring an agent. Thus, remembering the search, they believe they can fill the mind. The faculties are formed as vessels, vessels to be filled thanks to contentless formal reasoning, but they are formed by that formal approach malformed into the thought that the faculties require agents to enact them by filling them with information and forms of reasoning. So returning to the principal's prefatory letter, this circumstance means that the entire apparatus of scholastic and scholarly debate at the time had been malformed, and that, quote, those who have learned the least are the most capable of learning true philosophy, unquote. Hence, Although he writes in the fourth set of re replies to objections that Antoine Arnaud imagines theologians having to the meditations, those being that he did not deal with the first meditation's radicality of doubt when he, when he wrote the, the discourse, whose, whose audience was craftspeople and mathematicians, he still hopes in the discourse that readers will find things worth imitating for themselves. Descartes is consistently concerned that his audience not be bored that they can follow him and adopt and adapt what he presents on their own terms. He put it this way explicitly, he put it this way explicitly when introducing the world's fable. In the geometry, one of the essays included in the discourse, he presents his mathematics 
in a way that the reader can, uh, in a way that the reader can quote gain the pleasure of learning it for himself as well as the pleasure of cultivating his mind by training himself and in the prefatory letter to the principles for french translation he says that almost anyone's mind can enter into good opinions and scientific truth if they are led conduit if they are led properly that guidance in his textbook being to first read that book the principles quote like a novel so as to pique curiosity in all of these cases descartes interest is not in teaching not in forming or filling faculties forming them in the filling and therefore malforming them rather through a concern with not boring his readers by hoping they will discover pleasures on their own his concern is that his readers deform defer their minds that have been malformed by childhood assumptions but more importantly by the malformations and corruptions of scholastic concepts of faculties in particular that those faculties are waiting to be filled with formal reasonings in order to be activated that they are empty vessels thus descartes does not teach precepts and principles but shows gives examples to be imitated should we and estimate them worthy of it by the imaginations of our minds where there are no empty spaces thus despite his simile in the seven set of objections and replies descartes is not an architect of the mind in the manner of teachers there he says he digs for the foundations for his philosophy by means of radical doubt but this digging is not the formation of an empty space digging to empty things out is the work of teachers for whom everything omnia must be removed and nothing nihil whatever left or if he is an architect he is at least not an archon for whom legacies are irrelevant the arche the foundation of his philosophy is neither an empty space nor is it meant as something prescribed for all anyone who reads his philosophy must take it up as their own must imagine themselves in his imaginary place or in the imaginary space of a fable nevertheless he is also not an arch anarchist since he does seek foundations origins the point of presenting his method and philosophy to his readers is for them to find their own origins to start again by means of their imaginations to reform their their ways of thinking unmake and reshape their minds as is most helpful for them descartes is an origo someone who founds a beginning which begins anew every time someone imitates his origin with their own every time they appreciate what he has shown the problem he sees with scholastic and scholarly teaching is that its prescriptions malform the mind in such a way that thinking becomes a mere pulling out of preformed answers to to any possible question a pulling out made possible by the forming of the faculties as empty vessels this malformation is possible because these teachers do not understand the mind as a plenum with sparks that can be drawn out of it by means of the imagination thus to originate to reoriginate thinking as a thinking that will be its own activity not enacted by another agent's forms of reasoning he must spark the imagination to deform the mind and reform the i.e. the very non non-extended substance of which the imagination is a part this foundation of thinking at every moment this refoundation of thinking at every moment of thinking on one's own is descartes legacy a legacy of origos teaching themselves as originating in his imaginative example Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. I have a lot of questions, but I would like to give the floor to anybody else. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's that. That really has got me thinking. Um, and it really is the same thing, I guess. Whenever I hear a bit something about Descartes, which is um, that my original ideas about what he was saying uh, are can't really be relied upon and in particular this uh, this sense of the imagination um, is uh, uh, bringing that to the fore certainly uh, has tensions with how we typically think about Descartes um, whereby uh, we would imagine or, or we, would, we would possibly most readily say that resisting the imagination is, is the proper way to arrive 
uh, at conclusions. It's only by doing that. Um, we can think of an example with respect to space and deformation, perhaps, which is in um, uh, uh, the, the extended meditations where um, he gives out his work to his colleagues. And his, his colleague says, ah, but if you're resisting the, um, the evil demon, um, how can you talk about complex objects like the chili argon? It's a thousand-sided object. And, um, well, what Descartes says really amounts to um, not having to rely on the imagination as such because we have simple concepts. We, can, uh, we understand what a thousand is. We understand what a sided object is. And we can combine those. And, and we know, even though the evil demon is showing us a picture and it's a many-sided object, we don't know whether that's a chili argon or not, but we know a chili argon exists. So if we are led properly in our concepts, that sounds a great deal like resistance to uh, imagination. However, um, I, I mean, there's, there's more to this, of course, uh, uh, as your paper brought out, I feel, because we're talking there about figure rather than space as such. Um, nevertheless, I suppose it, it, it leads the question on a bit, because we, we are then, uh, we, we, we could then say something like, is an, a kind of independent space allowable through imagination, but any time, um, the, or, or, or the conception of it is allowable through imagination, but any time you want to talk about figure or any or really predicate anything of it, then do we then have to start expunging the imagination? Uh, an, an independent space, a, a space, a, 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 what we think of as the Cartesian graph. So, yeah, this is uh, odd in terms of a traditional reading of, of Descartes. Um, and one of the traditional readings of Descartes is always that, like all the early moderns, if there's one thing that all the early moderns are united with, it's push away the imagination, that's part of scholasticism, and that sort of thing. Um, but, so, um, one of the ways I wound up in this kind of spot in the research was um, first by just asking why on earth, it's a, one of these stupidly obvious questions that other people have written on, but why on earth does Descartes introduce his physics by calling it a fable? The guy who's trying to give us clear and distinct knowledge tells us right off the bat he's going to lie to us, and give us a fiction. Um, and then once I started paying attention to the changes that, that go on in, in the way that he's thinking about the, the imagination and the passions, which is the last book, and unfortunately not something that's talked about very much, or not enough anyway, um, it becomes clear that he's got, some, he's got something going on in his concept of the imagination that goes through a variety of changes over his career. In the meditations, yeah, he does want to say it's absolutely something to resist. The Chile Agon example is the best best example, because you can't close your eyes and imagine a chili again, or at least not, you wouldn't know that it's accurate, right? And this is just to use the computer example that you were bringing up. You can produce one through pure mathematics and coding or something like that. Um, or at least think that you can. So, part of what I think is going on over the course of his career, especially if we think about what um, Makamar and Maguire call his intuitionism early on in the Cogitationes when he says, you know, the imagination can strike the mind and, and create sparks. That's this intuitionism that we have, this flash or something like that. And he resists that. But I really do think it comes back in the, in the passions. But the concept or the thought of what the imagination is has transformed. Such that, um, so there are some people who want to say that there are two imaginations, that there's a parallel form of the imagination, and so on and so forth. 
but it's clear, it's very clear that they've, that they've listed twice in two different functions in the passions. So I kind of wanted to think, well, just because he lists them twice doesn't necessarily mean it's a different thing, right, or a different faculty, because it's not an accident that he's using the word. He's not, he's not dumb. He knows what he's doing when he chooses words. Um, and so I think part of what he's doing over the course of that process is kind of, to a certain degree, dislodging the concept of the imagination from its etymological origin in imago, in image, right? And thinking of it as something that is, for lack of a better term, productive. I don't know how, I don't know, I, it's not the right word, but it's the one I can think of at the moment. So that what, what we're actually seeing in these moments like the world and the meditations and so on is the imagination producing the very rational activity that he says he's going to engage in. And it's the exact same thing that happens in the discourse. When he goes into his autobiography, he introduces it by saying, I'll, I'm going to tell you this by means of a fable, uh, sorry, by means of a, 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 a story or a fable. He knows he's telling this specifically and he's telling each of his audience members, who are different types of people, the discourse is written in French to appeal to craftsfolk who aren't formally educated. The Meditations is written in Latin because he's trying to get uh, permission to print, print this stuff from the church in the, in the Sorbonne. He's writing this in such a way to kind of spark the way that people can think. And that can't be done by just appealing to scholastic methodological forms of proof and it can't be done by just kind of saying, well, here's the new mathematics. The discourse is written as an introduction to his new mathematics. So something else is going on here, and I think he really shifts the way that he thinks about the imagination, or something a little bit closer to maybe how we think about the imagination in a post-romantic world. In terms of the question of independent sta space, uh, no. The, the, I mean, if by independent space you mean an enclosure of space. It would, that would be what the late scholastics were talking about when they talked about imaginary space, is this kind of nothing that surrounds. No, no, he's, real, he's consistent throughout his entire career. There's nothing like that. The world is a plenum. The world is full. There are no vacua. Um, which means then that there's a really interesting way to think about, for me at least, there's a really interesting way to think about the, the possible connections between mind and world in the sense that, well, th if they're both kind of, if there is no space that's independent of me, then in the sparking of my imagination, or sorry, in the sparking of my mind that allows me to rethink how the world operates in the first place, in a certain weird way, I'm also engaging directly the world, mentally. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, I felt like it was bad. <laughs> this is super exciting. Can I, I, I want to add on this, maybe, if, and, and invite you to um, maybe make a connection. So in what I was very fascinated when I began to look at his uh, dioptrics is that he addresses the sense of vision through the instrumentality, no? And he says, and he says so his example is, um, imagine a blind man who learns to see with a stick. So if he learns to see with the stick, he sees much less than he, when he has been living like that for 20 years. And then he says, this is now not an extraordinary example of how something natural could be corrected, but he makes it the paradigm for his idea of a natural vision for everyone. And this I found super interesting because, yeah, it's a cornucopian kind of instrument, no? <laughs> this kind of, uh, of facilitator or of, of, of medium with which we learn to form or first emptying out <laughs> and then form the mind. Can you make connections of this, which is a very technical figure, to this interesting constellation between fable discourse and dialogue? Because you said, you said no, the, so truth, the pursuit of truth is a dialogue, and dialogue basically means it's either one with oneself or with somebody else. Yeah. But it's a closed, it's a circular, and it's a very, uh, so the, the people who are involved in dialogue are not many. Yeah. Whereas discourse, begins to be taught in a community anchored through a shared acceptance of method and explicit method. So already these two things are odd. No? He writes on method, a discourse on method, not method in order to have a discourse, but he's interested in dialogue as the pursuit of truth, and he places everything in a fable, 
and he celebrates instruments. Okay. <laughs> um, so, it, yeah, that, that point about the, in, in particular the... <laughs> that point about Descartes is, is one of the points that I really like that Jean-Luc Marion brings up in a few points that he said, Descartes's not the guy sitting in, in some kind of removed position, that despite what the tradition tells us, he's constantly engaged in dialogue with other people. This is crucial for him. Um, okay, so in terms of the question of the guy with the, the stick, which is one of my favorite examples, um, this is all part of ways for him to get us to understand what he calls, and I find the, fa the, I find the, um, the term fascinating, what he calls the, our, our natural geometry, the mind's natural geometry, by which he literally means, you know, the eyes is the base of the triangle and so on, such that we can judge distance and so on and so forth. So there's a weird way in which he's acknowledging that by in, in, our, in our literal biological ways of engaging the world, we're doing geometry. We're which, but we need to rethink how we actually engage the world, and that is going to require a type of story or a type of fable. Um, in terms of the formal mathematics, that is the chapter of the book that I didn't have a chance to write, <laughs> and I haven't really worked it out, but I do think that the way that he talks about his shifts with algebra in terms of thinking of these problems is already solved is a way for him to, this is the way he introduces it to lens crafters primarily, uh, is a way to keep them from being bored, which means it serves a very similar rhetorical function as the fable does in some of these methodological and, and scientific pieces, or metaphysical pieces. Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm just curious to hear more. I, I really liked this phrase or this idea that teaching is, um, or this alternative to teaching, this like non-scholastic teaching, um, was something like digging to empty things out. And I guess I was just curious um, if you could say more, given, given this kind of picture of the materiality of the mind being, um, you know, one in which, like the plenum, there is no emptiness. Mm -hmm. So what, what does it mean to sort of dig for, in, in this in this formulation, um, yeah. What does it mean to dig? Yeah. Um, and it, yeah. So I mean, this is where maybe the the word deforming um, the malformed um, gives some sort of conceptual um, grips. But if you could just say more about that, because I thought it was a really interesting idea. I think the easiest way is that I've read a lot of Derrida, <laughs> um, and so there's a way in which I'm thinking of him as a kind of deconstructive thinker in this way, in his at least in his relationship to the to scholasticism. Um, which is one reason why all, so much of his writing has to be performative, or, or at least spark, sparking, sparkful, something along those lines. Um, yeah, or at least, uh, if not performative, then, or technically performative, then a showing, which is the constant term that he uses. It's always about showing, it's never about teaching for him. Yeah, I feel like there's something I was going to say, and now I can't get it, sorry. <laughs> but aren't there cracks in the plenum? But there's no vacuum. Yeah, so but the, cracks. Yeah, well, but they... In <laughs> it's a quantum in the paradox, yeah, no? <laughs> in the world, not originally, right? In the, in the plenum of the, the physical world, that gets the cracks get introduced by God, which then sets off all the materi uh, material motion, but yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah? Yeah. Thanks for your very nice talk. Uh, I would just like to make a comment that uh, starting to deforming means that you already have some form. Mm. So you think that the imaginary has some form? The what? Sorry. The imaginary in the thinking of the cart. Is it having some form? Or the mind, yeah. And uh, maybe it relates with the discovery of the, uh, what we call now the logarithmic spiral? The what? I'm sorry, the difference in that. The logarithmic spiral, you know, the equiangular, uh, equiangular spiral, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. is the discovery of the cart. Mm 
although it is attributed to Bernoulli, the Spira Mirabilis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, there is a parallel in the thinking of uh, Descartes and the thinking of Archimedes. They are both discoverers of spirals. Yeah. And they both wrote a book called The Method. Yeah. <laughs> so I would like to see now if, uh, so it's one question put, uh, if you think that the imaginary has some form, and if you think that if, yes, if it has any relation with the spiral that he discovered, it was his inspiration. Okay. I'm going to just preface this by saying that is way, this is way beyond my capacities in mathematics. <laughs> um, yeah, he, 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 he doesn't actually, outside of saying, making the Archimedean Foundation line, he mostly references uh, Diophantus of, of Alexandria in terms of ancient mathematics and um, the other guy from Alexandria, whose name I'm blanking on at the moment, um, in their algebra or their proto-algebra, essentially. Um, so yes, in terms of his understanding of the history of, despite, and this is part of Descartes' obsession with being original, he's notorious for not acknowledging his, he doesn't cite, and he, and he has a lot of inspirations. Uh, I'm not aware of a specific moment in the letters where he specifically references Archimedes in terms of thinking of the spiral, but he's too well educated in, in mathematics for me to think that he's not in some way inspired by it. Um, the, me the, the issue is that it's too, the, me the methodol ancient methodologies are problematic because they, uh, they don't allow people to think on their own. And this is how he puts it throughout various letters and, and the geometry and things like that. It's a methodological problem. One more? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much.